I think we can start. Um, uh, we have attendees still coming in, but uh, I'll start with the introduction and then we can go. So welcome everyone. Uh, Lectures Without Borders and Europlanet are very pleased to welcome you today for our EPSC 2021 Goes Live for School event. Uh, today, we are going to hear about uh, the exciting world of building robots for the exploration of Earth and other planets. Uh, we have today two speakers. We have Catherine Reagan, who is a PhD student at the Muller Space Science Laboratory, UCDL. She's investigating the magnetic environment of Mars, working towards the launch of the Rosalind Franklin rover in 2022. And she has a uh, master's degree in planetary science. Uh, and we also have Jan Obderbeke, uh, who is an engineer working at the French Institute for the Study of the Sea, Ifremer, uh, as the head of the unit for underwater systems. He has a PhD in physics from the Université Thierry Marie Curie in Paris. And he is working on underwater systems for the exploration of our oceans. Um, so the we are going to hear from our two speakers for roughly 20, 25 minutes. And after that, we will open the floor for questions. So uh, attendees, you have two panels that you can use for that. You can use the chat or you can use the question and answer panel. And we will be collecting your, um, your questions. You can also ask questions on our channel on YouTube and we will be collecting them and, and directing them towards our speakers uh, during the session, the Q&A session afterwards. So again, thank you everyone for being here today and let's hear from our speakers. Catherine, the floor is yours. Hi everybody, I hope you can see my screen okay. I'm going to assume that you can. Um, so welcome to this talk. We are going to be talking about rovers on earth and beyond. So I am Catherine Regan. So the talk's going to be split into two. I'm going to start by talking about rovers on Mars, and then I'm going to hand over to Jan, who will be talking about deep sea rovers on Earth. So we're going to cover two different planetary bodies today. So why are we so interested in Mars? This is a question that I get quite a lot um, being a Mars PhD student. And us as humans, we have been observing Mars for thousands and thousands of years. And the reason that we call the red planet Mars is because the Greeks and the Romans named the planet after their god of war because of the red color. And we are looking for life on another planet. And we have been doing this for as long as we've been looking into the stars. And Many sci-fi films and sci-fi series and video games have kind of run with this theory about life um, on other planets, especially Martian life. And we can thank this mainly by a guy called Giovanni Schiaparelli, because in 1888, he observed Mars. And you can see um, this is one of his um, sketches of the red planet here. And he describes these features as canali. Now, this was wrongly translated to be canals which led to many people think that they're intelligent aliens on the surface of Mars building canals, the man-made feature. What he actually meant was channels by this, but this kind of kick-started um, the Martian sci-fi life and um, kind of world that we see it today. We also look for um, evidence of water on the surface and the subsurface because water is such a key part of life on Earth. We think if we can find water on another planet, then that might indicate that there is life elsewhere and that could evolve into something we are familiar with um, on Earth as well because water is such a key part of our lifestyle. And all of this is thinking about what Mars was like in the past. What we're used to now is a very dry and arid environment, but we think going back millions or even billions of years ago, it could have been completely different. There may have been river channels, liquid water, and this could potentially harbour life. So we're asking the lifelong question of, is there life on Mars? So how do we do science on other planets? It's not very easy to just pop over there and do some um, experiments in person, because that is the best way to do science. So we have to look for other options. One of the ways we do this is from satellites. So three of the satellites um, that are currently still in operation at Mars is the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, MAVEN and Mars Express. These are all there um, operating right now, collecting data that scientists around the world are working on. And the other way we can do science on Mars is by rovers. 
And this is what I'm going to talk about in more detail. So here we have an example of some of the rovers that are on Mars. We've got Curiosity, Perseverance and Ingenuity that are all still working and still collecting data. And Spirit on the far right that unfortunately is no longer operating, but managed to do some really amazing science while it was there. So what kind of science can we do with these rovers? There are so many rovers currently on or have been on Mars working. There were too many highlights for me to choose. So I just chose a couple of missions and kind of I thought I'd get some cool images to show just what we can do with rovers on Mars. So the first one is the Viking lander, which was um, landed on the surface in 1975. And this was the first spacecraft to safely land on the surface. So there have been attempts beforehand, but these either crashed or were unsuccessful or didn't deploy. So this was the first successful one. And Viking returned some amazing images from the surface of Mars. These are images that we'd never seen before because we just had satellite images from really far up, um, above in the orbit. And not only did it return some beautiful images like this one on the bottom here, it also discovered some chemical activity in the Martian soil. Next, we have Spirit and Opportunity, two very famous rovers that arrived in 2004. And um, Opportunity, unfortunately, um, stopped operating in 2018. So they had a really long operational life. But these two rovers um, worked separately and together to do some chemical analysis of Mars, and they found evidence of hot springs or hot steam vents that were there in the past in Mars. And that's really exciting because not only do we have liquid water, we have hot springs. So that was really exciting. And they also found lots of clay minerals in the soil, and that as well indicates that we had water in the past at Mars. And then another type of lander that's not quite a rover because um, it remains stationary is the InSight lander that landed in 2018. This is a different type of robot. So this lander is measuring for Mars quakes, which is the Mars version of earthquakes. So it's looking for seismic activity at Mars, and this can help us understand the structure of Mars. So if there is a core, if there is a mantle and a crust like we're used to on Earth, or if it's something completely different. So here we've got an example of what the data looks like from this instrument. And this is really exciting because it's quite different to the other rovers. And finally, um, probably the most famous thing that's been happening in science news this year has been the Ingenuity helicopter. So this is the first flight we've had from Mars, um, the first flight in another planetary atmosphere. So being able to fly a drone or a helicopter like Ingenuity is a huge achievement because the atmosphere of Mars is just so drastically different to Earth. We had no idea if it was going to be successful or not, but it was. I think it's now um, nearly at the 20th flight or may even be more. It's been able to get tons of data and get lots of really cool images from the surface of Mars. So that's been a real highlight of Mars exploration. But how do we design a rover for Mars? There's lots of different things that we have to think about. And there's a few questions that we need to answer. So mainly, what are the science objectives? Are we trying to achieve flight on another planet like Ingenuity? Are we looking for Mars quakes like the InSight lander? Or do we want to kind of look for minerals or look in the soil? Um, these are all different types of science that we can do, but they require different types of instruments to do them. So what instruments do we need? Do we need um, kind of magnetometers that look at magnetic data? Do we need lots of cameras so we can get lots of images? Or do we need um, some equipment that we can do chemical analysis with? So all of these different things need to be considered. Are we going to move and stay in one place? If we're stationary, like the InSight lander, we don't need to worry about wheels. But if we are wanting to move, then we need to think about how we design the wheels. So here you can see some images from the Opportunity rover, and you can see that the wheels have been damaged by lots of the rocks. So these are all things we need to consider. We need to make sure they're strong and sturdy. If, in a worst case scenario, we lose a wheel, can we still operate? Can we still move? These are all technical things that we need to think about. And how are we going to get power? Do we want to use solar panels? Do we want to use batteries? Batteries are heavier and a bit more expensive, but if we use solar panels, then we have the worry about dust. And here we have the Opportunity Rover again, and Opportunity solar panels covered in dust. And the reason that Opportunity unfortunately stopped working in 2018 was because dust covered the entire planet in a huge storm and stopped the solar pa panels receiving any sunlight, so it couldn't get any power. So if we do decide to have solar panels as um, the battery operating power or the power system, then how are we going to solve the problem of dust? 
And also Mars's temperature range is very different to Earth. So it averages about minus 40 degrees Celsius, minus 50 degrees Celsius, but that can go all the way to minus 130. And then on a warm day on Mars, it can get to about zero degrees Celsius. So the temperature range is really different. So we need to be able to design equipment that can withstand this difference in temperature. And also the gravity on Mars is really different as well. And this is why the Ingenuity helicopter had to be designed really carefully because the gravity is only a third of what we have on Earth. So things are a lot lighter and things will move and travel differently with a difference in gravity. And Mars is also really exposed to radiation. So on Earth, we have an amazing protective bubble called our magnetosphere that protects us from really harmful radiation from the sun. And unfortunately, Mars does not have a protective bubble like we do. And this means the radiation can reach a rover or reach some machinery that we've put and it could fry the circuits. It could cause a lot of damage. It could give us false readings. So these are things that we need to consider when designing these components. We need to protect them from this really harmful radiation because we want them to be able to work and to be able to work well. And finally, we have what we call these seven minutes of terror. And this is the journey that the rover will do from leaving the spacecraft in orbit around Mars all the way down to the surface. So this journey is a real high speed, high temperature and high pressure journey going into the atmosphere of Mars and landing on the surface. And during these seven minutes of terror, the communications at Earth aren't available because it takes around 11 minutes at best for data to get sent from Mars to the Earth. So we don't know if something could have landed successfully or it could have failed during these deadly seven minutes. So we have to make sure things are programmed to land successfully um, without any input from us at the time. So the seven minutes of terror sounds very ominous. Finally, I thought I'd talk about the next Mars rover, which is one that I am involved with. And this is the ExoMars rover, which has been named Rosalind Franklin. So this rover is launching next September, so just under a year away, September 2022, and it will arrive at Mars in spring 2023. Now, this is mainly a European Space Agency mission, but it is also joint with Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency, as they are building and helping us with the landing module that will get the rover safely onto the surface. This rover has seven different scientific instruments, but the two most exciting features, in my opinion, are the two metre drill. So this will be the deepest ever drill to go into Mars. So for context, the Perseverance rover, the NASA rover that landed this year, only goes about seven centimetres into the Martian soil, whereas this will go two metres in. So that's really exciting. We'll go deep into the Martian surface. And the camera at the top, so this kind of square bit at the top, we call the eyes on Mars. And this has three different cameras on it. It's got two panoramic cameras at the end, which can be used to create 3D images and also has different filters to look at different parts of the Martian atmosphere. And then it has a high resolution camera in the middle. So we're going to be able to get really detailed and different images from the Martian surface, which we can then use through different scientific analysis on. And that's what I'm going to be working on. I'll be looking at the dust in the atmosphere of Mars when it lands in 2023, which is really exciting. So that's everything about Mars rovers. I want to hand over to Jan to talk to you about Earth. Thank you, Catherine. OK, I assume you can see my screen. <clears throat> yes. Hi, everyone. I am Jan Becke, and thank you, uh, Ulysse, for the introductions and Catherine for the amazing talk about the prospect about the Mars rovers. And uh, uh, a little bit in opposition to this, we will go back to planet Earth and uh, the blue planet, and we will dive below the surface of the ocean, um, even if we wish to know a lot about uh, what is happening in space. Uh, we, we still do not know a lot about Earth's oceans and only a few percent uh, of uh, the deep, uh, deep sea environment has been explored so far. Um, and IFRAMER is an institution uh, that uh, runs uh, ocean science projects, but also provides the technical means at sea, underwater uh, vehicles and robots in order to explore the deep sea. 
Be before going a little bit into the details, uh, I would like to compare a little bit the environment um, our robots work in. Uh, we have we have uh, the space environment we have launched something about, and uh, now we're looking to the deep sea. Uh, to say it simply, it's all about the physics. There are maybe three major points. There are certainly more, and Catherine had, has mentioned some. Uh, I had noted three uh, main uh, criteria where the environment is really different. One is pressure. Uh, we at the sea level or in, in Earth's atmosphere do not really experience uh, pressure, even if there's one atmosphere or one bar uh, as the physical unit uh, of, of uh, pressure. Uh, and in space, the pressure drops almost to zero, but on, on, on Mars, we have learned that uh, uh, there is an atmosphere and there's pressure to some extent. But when we go below the surface of the ocean uh, with the weight of the seawater, the pressure increases very rapidly and uh, exerts a very strong effort on the physical structures we, we want to build. Um, a human diver, for example, can only uh, resist to the uh, roughly 10 bars or it's some, an amount of something like 10 kilograms per square centimeter uh, down to 100 meters of depth. Um, some fish go very deep down to the deepest of the points in the ocean. Whales go down to three or 4,000 meters. Uh, and our robot vehicles, uh, we want to go all the way, at least some of them, and they have to resist to incredible pressures, uh, which uh, exerts a um, force of uh, equivalent to a thousand kilogram a ton uh, per square centimeter. Uh, so we have to, to work with this constraint. Uh, the gravity we have seen is different, but when we go below the sea, uh, we we have gravity uh, gravity on one hand, and we have the floatability uh, on, on the other hand, which is uh, uh, when we di displace a volume of water uh, and our structure is possibly lighter than, than the water, then we have an upward force that brings us back to the surface. When we design an underwater vehicle, we want it to be neutral in order to easily um, direct itself in any, in, in any way, uh, like a fish. Uh, and then the, the, the last uh, uh, criteria is radioactive propagation. Um, we have seen that uh, in most, uh, most of the time, the Mars rover can be connected to Earth by radio. In the underwater environment, that is not possible. We, we, the radio um, electric waves cannot propagate in seawater. So we have no communication. We have no light. And after a couple tens of meters, there's no light left in, in, in the seawater. So we have to bring on, equip our robot with uh, light projectors. Uh, there is uh, uh, no GPS, and it's absolutely important to have precise positioning of all scientific data. So we are using uh, acoustics, and uh, we build some of the functions I've mentioned uh, with acoustic based on acoustic uh, propagation in order to have some kind of positioning, to have communication, even if it's at very, very low bandwidth. Uh, so we substitute some of the functions as good as we can uh, through the acoustic channel. Uh, well, knowing this, we can have a look at what is happening, uh, what work we are doing um, in, in the subsea and what we are interested in. Um, maybe we, look, we start looking at these videos uh, the first thing that left is ecosystems, biology, um, biodiversity, and ecosystems is a major central point in, in deep uh, ocean research. Uh, and today, the uh, ecosystems in the deep ocean, even to the deepest points, are uh, menaced by climate change. And uh, uh, we try to understand how these ecosystems work in order to see how they will resist or not, or what are the menaces, uh, how, how they will evolve in the future. So here you see, I've seen examples of deep water corals. And what for me was always uh, um, um, an impressive uh, 
consideration is that it's this astounding beauty of corals at 1,000 or 2,000 um, meters uh, depth are very beautiful, but there's no light anybody could see them. So only we switch on the lights of our robot and we can see this, this surprising beauty. Um, Catherine had mentioned uh, visual sensors, all types of cameras. In the center here, you see um, a three-dimensional reconstruction of a shipwreck. And this is using around 4,000 still photos stitched together and modeled in a 3D model. Uh, and uh, here you can not only see what the robot or a pilot eventually can see is only a few meters of, of uh, lightened uh, area. Here you can see the whole scene. You can see the whole wreckage. Um, to the right, we have an underwater environment uh, around uh, a hydrothermal vent. And hydrothermal vents have rev revolutionized uh, science of the origins of life because uh, one of the major discoveries around 30 years ago was that life can appear uh, in areas where there's no light. Uh, up to then, it was a, uh, um, a paradigm in, in, in science that life needed light. And hydrothermal vents are small volcano sort of structures with hot water and methane probably, uh, other elements flowing out of the earth, providing uh, energy in form of, of heat, uh, but also uh, other stuff. Methane is consumed by uh, bacteria, and then there are other organisms eating the bacteria and so on. And there's a complete ecosystem, which is around 10 meters in diameter, so very, very small. Um, up here, uh, we see that we also am interested in taking samples uh, of all things. In, in this kind, it's archaeology. So we push away the, the sand, and we are then able to, to carry the uh, pottery, the, the uh, uh, object, archaeological object, in order to uh, bring it to the surface. Uh, well, the vehicles we use for all this are, are uh, manifold. We, we use a manned submersible, which is in operation for more than 30 years. Uh, we use what we call an ROV. An ROV is a remote operated vehicle. It is linked to the vessel by a cable, so we can interactively work on the seafloor, even not being there. Uh, and uh, the hybrid ROV Ariane is a similar thing, only linked with the optic tether. Uh, and then we have other sorts of vehicles which are autonomous, and they are completely on their own. They don't communicate with the surface, and in their dive, they will have to take all the decisions in order to accomplish their, their mission, uh, and they have to handle dangerous situation or anomalies uh, on their own. Uh, and the newest of them is uh, Ulix here, it's called Coral, that's the name of the project. Uh, it's a new autonomous underwater vehicle working down to 6,000 meters of depth, and we'll see a little bit more about this vehicle. Uh, maybe a difference with the space rovers is that, uh, the planetary rovers, excuse me, is that these vehicles are operated on a daily basis. They can be deployed 50, 100, 150 days per year, which is enormous. Uh, and then they will go uh, into their environment down there for uh, 10, 20, 50 hours. Uh, and uh, we have seen that on Mars, um, the, the rovers are sent there once, and then they operate for a very long time. So it's a, a fundamental difference between those two. Now, if you look at the design process, for this Ulix AUV, we have uh, a few tasks we wish it to come to accomplish. It has to be able to provide high resolution acoustical mapping. And when it is doing this, it carries sonar um, uh, equipment that uh, use acoustic imagery to, to produce uh, a map of the seafloor. And this can cover tens, several tens of square kilometers. Uh, and for that, the AUV will uh, run at maybe 50 meters above the seafloor, quite a distance, uh, and go as fast as possible. Uh, but then we also want to, to go close to the seabed and, and provide optical images, because for 
for us humans, still the optical image is, has a, a large amount of information. We want to construct uh, optical 3D models using photogrammetry techniques, for example, uh, as we have seen with the, the shipwreck in the previous slide. Uh, and then we want to add um, a set of scientific sensors adapted to the relevant project, uh, measuring the magnetic field or the physical parameters of the water or uh, take samples of the ocean water. Uh, now in the design process, this is something quite iterative. Uh, it's this sort of circle we see here. We have a rough idea when we start, but then we will have to start somewhere. So for example, we start with the thrusters and we choose the motors, the propellers, and we say we have this kind of force to propulse the vehicle. Uh, and then we know the electric power we need for this. We can uh, calculate, determine the battery capacity uh, in, in terms of the endurance. And, and uh, the batteries are probably the biggest weight factor. Uh, so we'll have an overall weight. We have to compensate with flotation devices uh, in order to be neutral in the water, as we have seen previously the Archimedes uh, principle. Uh, and then we will somewhere close the loop and check all the performances our robot has. And in most cases, it's not only one tour we do in the circle. We have to do it several times because we can see that the propulsion system is too, uh, it's not strong enough. We have to add there or we have not enough battery and so on. So it's often uh, a long process to, to dimension the, the robot system. And for Ulix, the result is uh, this uh, square section vehicle. It has a, uh, it is not a small uh, AUV. It is 4.5 meters in length with a square section roughly almost 10, uh, almost three tons of weight. And it has roughly the um, electrical energy stored in, bathroom, in lithium ion batteries, uh, similarly to a, a car, a Tesla car, for example. And with that, we were able to run 36 hour profiles on the seafloor. Uh, and this uh, allows to, to run a range of uh, 150 kilogram approximately. Um, well, we wanted to take photos on the seafloor, so we need to be able to stop the uh, plane mode running quickly over at a given altitude uh, and not stopping. We, we have to stop in order to zoom uh, in and hover close to the seabed uh, and take pictures. Um, the visibility in the seawater is only a couple of meters, so we have to go very, very uh, close to the seafloor. Uh, and this is why we have uh, a double thruster at the end, and we have uh, vertical thrusters. And with that, we can manage the hovering process close to the seafloor. Um, and uh, uh, so we have different navigation modes. We can switch from one to the other at any moment. Uh, and we use several, what we call payload functions. Uh, the acoustic mapping with different kinds of uh, equipment, the optic mapping and imaging, and the scientific sensors. And all those are used according to the, the navigation mode we, we, we switch on. Uh, in order to illustrate this, we see here um, a map of, of the, the south of France. So we are here somewhere in the middle of that. But the area depicted here is what we probably would see in, in 24 hours of shipborne acoustic uh, mapping survey. Uh, and the, the resolution is about 20, 20 meters for one pixel. Uh, and uh, of course, this is not sufficient for precise scientific work. Uh, so we will uh, select a smaller portion of area and there with an underwater vehicle like Ulix, we can provide a map uh, with a resolution of roughly a meter. So in that image, you can see uh, the bigger squares, which are the pixels seen from the surface, and then the higher resolution map provided by the AUV. And you see how much detail uh, you can see in there. Uh, and uh, we can even use the intensity image. Uh, and this gives even more detail here with the, the shipwreck seen by the acoustic sonar. Sonar is something similar to radar uh, in, in, in air. 
Uh, and uh, well, then the, the next step, but now we are really very close to the seafloor. We can only cover a very small extent of area. Uh, we will have the optical images. And once again, we see here a stitched mosaic of, of, of images uh, above. Uh, and, uh, and we can uh, go into this and, and pick details and uh, the, the native resolution of the optical images are preserved. And we can down, go down all the way down to the, the C star details you, you can see there uh, with the resolution close to one millimeter. So the, the mission of, of Ulix is to provide the larger maps, uh, but then on, on given detected targets uh, assigned by the scientists to provide the, the very detailed data in order to see uh, what's really on the seafloor. Uh, so to conclude the presentation, and uh, maybe both presentations, um, the paradigms for building a robot for you who potentially will be future engineers and uh, probably will be interested in developing uh, this kind of vehicles uh, in the next generation, uh, be it in for space or deep sea or, or any other environment, the first thing question to ask is what are the missions? What are the functions the robot has to accomplish? And what equipment does it have to carry and, and uh, operate? Uh, and the second question, as we have seen, is what are the physics? In what environment will the robot work eventually? And the third one is how will it be deployed? We have seen these seven minutes of terror. Uh, we have uh, something similar at sea when we deploy from the vessel or recover. The sea can be very bad. Uh, and uh, then we have to operate and maybe follow the vehicle with the, with the ship. Uh, so the deployment scenarios are very important uh, in the design process. Uh, and these are roughly the, the three most important uh, points we have to take in mind. Uh, thank you very much. If you have questions, I think Catherine and I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, this was fascinating and very exciting to see both sides of uh, exploration of those words we don't know much about, outer space and our oceans. Uh, we are already getting a lot of uh, questions in the chat. Uh, and by the way, Marina is saying thank you for the amazing presentations. Um, so uh, let's start. Uh, let's start with a question from Marina for Catherine. Uh, Marina is asking: When designing a rover, we take into consideration all the parameters you mentioned. So depending on what you want to check, the kind of instruments you want to have, the kind of different parameters due to the, the terrain that you will uh, you will drive through, etc. But how do scientists decide about the goals of each mission? And I guess that's a question also that Jan could answer afterwards because it's also applicable to Yves Remer. So Catherine? So it's very difficult for scientists to decide um, what the kind of main focus is. So um, this is a process that takes years and years to develop. So the ExoMars mission, the Rosalind Franklin rover, they started developing that mission in about 2003, 2004. So nearly 20 years later, um, it will be launching and landing. So there are thousands of scientists all over the world that study Mars and study different aspects of Mars um, and have different objectives. So I personally look at kind of um, magnetic um, stuff and I look at dust, whereas other scientists look at water, other scientists look at biology. So there's a lot of debating and there's lots of meetings to kind of decide what the main focus is. But at the end of the day, we all have the same goal of wanting to know more about Mars. And although I'm not a biologist and I don't understand much about biology, I know that if we find out lots about the biology of Mars, that will help me um, build up a picture about the dust on Mars and the magnetic environment of Mars because everything interconnects. So although um, in the short term, we might have different focuses in the long term, all we want to do is build up a better picture about how Mars has evolved and how Mars has got to where it is today. Um, and then in terms of day-to-day -day operations, so once we are on Mars, there are also lots of debates and lots of long meetings about what we want to do. So um, 
it's basically a lot of negotiations um, and lots of debating, um, but there's no arguments. We all want to find out more. So it's all about kind of taking our time and letting everyone have time to meet their aim. I hope that answered the question. Sure, definitely. So it's a long process and it's uh, just like everything in science, it's consensus and debate. So that's great. Yeah. Uh, Jan, maybe you can tell us about how, um, how do scientists decide about the goals of missions for yes, the it's, um, it's it's a long story. Um, um, the uh, it's like in, in space the the ships ship time and and the the use of a ship is decided years in advance, and a, a major scientific cruise expedition uh, is involving scientists in in multiple disciplines and from even from multiple countries, uh, and. Uh, uh, those are scientific projects that are built years in advance and uh, the whole cycle is maybe something like 10 years. So in, in the first place, um, the scientific project is, is presented to commissions who then accord the, the ship time to, to run a cruise. Uh, and this happens roughly two years before uh, the actual cruise. And then the work preparation work is started uh, and uh, at sea, um, the uh, scientists work uh, all around the clock in teams uh, in several layers. Those who are directly involved with the piloting and the conduct of, of, of the operation on there, but others uh, on the ship or even at land and uh, analyzing data, analyzing the results and uh, having meetings on how to proceed, how to go on in, in the cruise. So it's uh, uh, a very busy place, uh, a, a national graphic ship. A lot of people there uh, who work on the same goal. Uh, and then uh, on a completely other topic, we work on uh, the robot's capability uh, to decide on, on uh, its actions on its own. So uh, Ulix, uh, once it has done the more global area survey and has a global map of the survey, uh, it can use artificial intelligence in order to detect targets uh, and uh, related to uh, the relief uh, topography or uh, um, signatures in, in the scientific data and then can decide. And this has been, of course, prepared with the scientists and, and programmed as such. And then the AUV has criteria in order to decide to go close to the seafloor take pictures, take measurements locally. Uh, and we hope that it will on, be on an, on an exciting new target and not just on, on an old tire lying on the seafloor. Uh, but uh, there's a real challenge in giving the robot a capability uh, to decide on how to conduct its own mission. Mm -hmm. That's that's fantastic because this goes with uh, the next question I was going to ask. Thomas was asking exactly that about AUVs, do they use IA to choose their trajectory or are they controlled remotely? And so to summarize, they, you, you have a, uh, before they are deployed, you have a decision to make of what they will study. And then you have IA on top of that uh, so that they can make decisions along the way, right? Yes, uh, in fact, we, it is not very easy to translate the scientific reasoning into uh, uh, a design, uh, a decision, decisional autonomy in, in the robot. So what we do is we use IA and, and uh, well, uh, more conventional types of algorithms for analyzing the data and providing information. And the, the decision making is then something uh, uh, quite um, rigid. It is a, a tree of decisions. Uh, based on the information coming out of the this IA uh, IA process, and uh, then we we have decisions, and we can we know exactly how the robot will decide uh, in terms of the information uh, it's got, uh, and we have um, we can trace uh, in its history logs uh, precisely uh, in what way it has. Um, run inside this uh, tree of decisions, uh, and uh, we can we can precisely track what it has done. Uh, we want also to have a um, 
a guarantee that we have uh, at least part of the mission is providing useful data. So mostly mm -hmm. we will have, uh, let's say, 75% uh, roughly of uh, uh, pre-programmed uh, solid data and, and then um, some options and how to uh, get more out of it and, 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 and take ground to a thing uh, with the cameras and so on. So it's a trade-off between the uh, safety to have a, um, a guaranteed result and the aim to give new capabilities, intelligent capabilities uh, uh, to the robot which in, in some decisions will replace the scientists. And that is something very difficult to tackle. All right, um, that's, that's very interesting. So Catherine, do you do we use IA also for uh, for the operation of rovers on Mars? No, <laughs> not yet. Um, so, because there are so many different teams, countries, institutions involved with each mission, um, they all have to agree um, on where the rover goes and what the rover does. So, um, if we want to move. 10 centimeters in one direction that then has to be signed off by all the different teams that are involved in the mission um, mm -hmm. also um, what's quite a big thing about the rovers is they only have um, a certain amount of power per day or power per um, few hours or um, things like that and that has to be allotted very carefully so if we do want to move 10 centimeters obviously that's going to take power so it has to be agreed that we will use this amount of power to then move in this direction Alternatively, um, there's also a battle between we want this power to do this observation or we need the power to do um, to drill a sample. So there's lots of um, talking and discussing and disagreeing and then eventually agreeing about how we can unlock the power. So um, AI isn't as involved in Mars exploration yet, just because there are so many different voices that need to be heard. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Marina is asking a question for both speakers. How do you manage to repair rovers in space and remotely operated vehicles in the deep ocean? So... Um, very short for Mars, you can't. Yep. <laughs> um, very sad. I mean, there are multiple rovers um, that have been tried that have tried to go to the surface to do um, science that didn't work. They either crash landed on the surface or um, they landed safely, but didn't deploy correctly. Um, so those are just there, um, like waste and rubbish on the surface. And then we've got rovers like Spirit and Opportunity that have done amazing work, but um, have stopped working for one reason or another. So it would be amazing if we could go and fix Spirit and Opportunity and get them working again. Um, but the cost of that um, is extortionate. And I think if we're going to be spending that much money, uh, we might as well do it in new rover like Rosalind mm. Franklin. Mm. And Jan, how do we... No, it's, it's, it's not so different. Uh, in the deep sea, um, you cannot easily get something there to, to uh, uh, at least uh, uh, salvage uh, a broken, uh, broken robot. So it's... Uh, um, the, the effort is going into having diagnostics on board these robots uh, to allow them to, to react if there's anything uh, bad happening. Technical failures are, are always possible. In, in the deep sea, we are diving in a, in a liquid, which is a conductor for electric current. So we have to be completely, perfectly insulated. Uh, and and that's uh, other things uh, that can happen. So uh, uh, the robot is uh, um, uh, diagnosing its technical system permanently in order to decide to go back to the surface if that is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, some people have dived with these vehicles under the ice, so there's no way back to the surface, and then the vehicle is lost. Uh, uh, this did not yet happen to us, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and then, uh, fortunately, we can repair on deck of the ship. So once we have recovered uh, a robot that has uh, safely done the surface, uh, we have a lot of spare parts and we have uh, techniques in order to repair even when we are two weeks away from a harbor. Uh, we must have all the material and uh, uh, the parts uh, that allow to repair 
for the following dive. Mm -hmm. I mentioned we repeat, we have repeated dives and we can, we can have uh, 30 days of, uh, of diving. And sometimes people are working all night long in order to, to get the robot ready for the next dive. So we have that possibility uh, to inter, intervene on, on the ship, but not when it's down in the deep ocean. We can okay. get another vehicle there to salvage. Uh, so that's a possibility, but it's very limited because it can take months to get there. And uh, the robot probably has already disappeared. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the next question, I'm going through the chat. There's a lot in there. Uh, the next question is coming from Benjamin, who is asking in the future, he may be interested to take part in uh, underwater robotics operations, such as the Victor Simil, uh, which company should he look for to discover job opportunities? Um, well, in, I can speak for the engineering department at Ephemer, and I, I think it's, it's probably uh, true for, for companies working in this area. We, we mostly um, um, recruit people with a very strong skills in generic engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, software, data processing, instrumentation, and uh, then they get specialized uh, during their career. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's a long process. Uh, we rarely hire someone who already, or we, we, we rarely require um, already a skill in underwater technologies. Uh, we, we recruit the generic technology skills and, and then train people uh, on their jobs. And we are uh, only a team of around 40 and we have to have all the competences and skills in that team. So uh, uh, there's not uh, a lot of um, uh, recovery between, between the different competences. Every person is roughly uh, uh, responsible of, of their own job. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's continue with the questions. Um, okay, so just a, a quick one uh, from, uh, from Atanasia. She's asking, and do the ocean vehicles turn to the surface for charging sunlight at any point? Um, so do you have solar, basically solar powered uh, vehicles that go and dive in the sea. Yeah, uh, there are all kinds of uh, sounds. So the the uh, um, ROV remote operated vehicle is uh, powered by the surface. So it's the surface vessel, which at, at the scale of a robot is an infinite source of of energy. So it's uh, roughly a high voltage uh, line going down to the robot. Uh, in the case of the, the autonomous vehicles, uh, today the standard are uh, lithium ion batteries, mm -hmm. similar to cars. And they have been, we had a project with a uh, uh, hydrogen oxygen fuel cell, uh, which has some advantages, uh, but it has also a lot of inconvenience. Um, and you have to have the hydrogen reserves or produce hydrogen. So it's, it's not. Uh, Today, uh, a solution that is used a lot, it is not used in a standard way at the uh, And there are people, uh, there are robots that work only at the surface and they are, uh, they are using solar panels, okay. solar power. Uh, and there have been vehicles, uh, gliders as well, um, underwater gliders that recharge with uh, solar panels at, at the sea surface. Uh, but it's rather uh, an exotic solution. So it's maybe not efficient enough or technically it may work, but uh, uh, you, some of these vehicles need a lot of electric power. So it mm. you would need too large of surfaces for these solar panels. Okay, thanks. Um, Marina is asking us questions uh, uh, that are um, more about your vision of your work as a scientist. So uh, she says that her students and her always ask the invited speakers, what inspired you to become scientists? What were your favorite subjects at schools? And if you, have, if you had any obstacles, how did you overcome them? 
So Catherine, do you want to go first for this? Yeah, so I always loved science and maths at school um, and geography especially. I really enjoyed learning about volcanoes and earthquakes. Um, but when I was at high school, I wasn't into upset science. So I kind of thought that um, science wasn't a kind of possibility for me. I didn't think that I'd be able to go on to do it because I wasn't seen as particularly good at it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I studied um, at A level, so in um, the UK, that's the kind of level of education you do before you go to university. Um, I chose to study geography, physics and maths um, and worked really, really hard because I really enjoyed them um, and managed to go to do geophysics at university. So I actually did my undergraduate on Earth. I didn't do any space, any Mars stuff because I didn't think that I was clever enough or good enough to do that. So I learned a lot about volcanoes, um, weather, um, all sorts of amazing things that I really, really enjoyed. And then somebody said to me, well, have you ever thought about doing the same thing, but on a different planet? And I didn't think that I could do that because I hadn't done physics or astrophysics at university. So I then applied to do my um, master's degree in planetary science. Um, and stumbled upon doing Mars research. So I started off by doing Mars volcanoes um, because I could do that from doing Earth volcanoes. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just applied for loads of different work experience, um, tried to get as much experience as I possibly could. And now I'm doing a PhD on Mars. Um, and I've kind of, doing, I'm doing something different now. So I started off with volcanoes and environmental side of things. Um, and now I'm doing magnetic environments, which I had no experience in until a few years ago. So um, my advice would be, even if you're not seen as academically the best or the kind of brightest, as long as you're interested and passionate about something, then you're going to do well in it. So just do what you enjoy, because um, I've always enjoyed doing physics and maths, even if I wasn't the best at it. And I'm still now doing a PhD. Amazing answer. Thank you. Jan, what about you? Uh, well, I started uh, at some point after, after school, uh, my engineering studies in electrical engineering. And uh, when, when I started that, I have to admit, I, I didn't have a clue what it was all about and what I would do as, as, a, as a profession with that. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't really grow fond with uh, electronics and so on. Uh, and I uh, discovered uh, control theory and, uh, uh, and signal processing. And what was a little bit like a, three, uh, a math type, applied maths and physics and um, uh, automatic control and signal processing uh, was what, what, where I found my, um, my field. And uh, uh, I had the, the chance to, to do a PhD in, in that area. But then when I... At one point, I found the, this post job offering at Ephraimer. I saw that I could um, associate this passion for 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 um, computing stuff, computing something uh, with the sea, with the ocean. That was like a dream, and it is still. Uh, and uh, and and there, I'm 100% uh, uh, with Catherine. Uh, when we require, we we don't look for the the super brain. We look for the, the person with the strongest motivation, with the strongest enthusiasm and the capacity to get interested in things. And that's really what is building a team. And uh, uh, this is really what uh, you want to have when, when you work with people. Uh, it's their motivation. And uh, when people are motivated, they can deplace mountains, as we say in French. Yeah, thank you. Science is really a human project first. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Marina is also asking us, um, what do you consider being the coolest discovery in your field of research? That's, I feel, a, t a tough one. That's, Catherine? yeah, that's a very tough one. Um, because I mean, Mars exploration, there's so many amazing discoveries every day. Um, I think in general, Mars, my favorite discovery, I mentioned it briefly in my presentation, um, was the discovery made by the Spirit and Opportunity rovers that there were hot vents and um, hot springs on Mars. I think that was really cool because we've always known or had the idea that there were river channels 
um, on Mars, because we've seen from images, um, even from really good Earth observations, we can see river channels on Mars. But the discovery of there being river vents in the past was really exciting. And that was just done by accident. So opportunity, um, opportunity's wheels spun and released some dirt. And in that dirt, they found soil that was 90% silica, which mm -hmm. is a type of mineral that only forms in these hot vent environments. So they thought, well, we only get that type of mineral on Earth in hot vents. So therefore, there must have been hot vents at Mars at some point. So I think that's really cool because that was just done by accident. They weren't looking for that. They just kind of found that. Um, but in terms of my research, because I do dust and magnetism, I think the coolest thing I've discovered is that every few Mars years, Mars has these dust storms that cover the entire planet. So the entire planet is covered in one huge storm. And these storms are so strong, they can raise the global temperature of Mars by 40 degrees Celsius. And this can make the whole magnetic environment of Mars shift. And that's what my PhD is on. I just think that's really cool um, that Mars not only has a really thin atmosphere, which some people don't know, but it has the potential to have these huge globe global storms. So I think that's really cool. Thanks. Jan, what about you? Yeah, I had a, one experience uh, maybe almost 20 years ago. It was one of the first cruises exploring the cold water corals. And uh, uh, I was in charge of building the topographic map of uh, uh, deep sea mounts, uh, carbonate mounts. In fact, they are, uh, these are small uh, mountains um, around 100 meters high, and they are built from the corals that grow at roughly a centimeter per year maximum. And then uh, sand, with, with the ocean currents, sand will fill in and the corals die and grow again. And over hundreds of, and thousands of years, uh, these mounds have built up and provide an incredible, uh, beautiful uh, coral reef. And it's down there in the dark. I mentioned that before. Uh, we were maybe 30 scientists uh, having, it was done with the remote operated vehicle. So we had the data, the, the images uh, on the ship in real time and we were the scientific party of around 30, all were in, in a wow uh, uh, situation and seeing this amazing stuff for the first time. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a little bit philosophical. Uh, this is beauty and, and uh, nobody can see it. Even the fish have no light to see it. And uh, uh, we brought light there and we were able to see this environment. and. Uh, that has been for me maybe the, the most impressive experience uh, at sea. Thank you for sharing this. It's uh, fascinating. Um, I see that it's already 2 p.m. Uh, is it okay if we keep you for a bit longer? I still have one question in English for you. Um, and uh, for the chat, I see that we have two attendees at least that are speaking French. Um, so if you want to ask a question in French, uh, feel free to do so. Jan can, can answer in French. Catherine, unfortunately, cannot. But uh, if you want, uh, we can offer that for the last uh, five minutes. The, the last question in English I have for you comes from Anastasia. She's, uh, uh, she's giving a bit of context and then the question. So let me read that. Um, she says that some years ago, novels of Ray Bradbury were describing the people settling on Mars. Uh, it seemed like a very distant future. And now we have people like Elon Musk uh, heading towards Mars. And now we see in the news that the Earth shall be a vacation place soon. Um, and people will be living in the space. Um, so the question is probably for the two of you, it's uh, more about anticipation. It's what shall the novelists be dreaming about in the next years? What is the future you are dreaming about? So oh, it's a very interesting question. Um, I could probably do a whole talk about my opinions on living on Mars. And personally, I don't agree with it. I don't think it's a very good idea. Um, for many of the reasons I talked about, um, including the radiation, that's a big problem. Um, but I think the next few years for science 
Um, although I'm a Mars scientist and I love when we send all these amazing missions to Mars, I think there's so much more of the solar system we need to explore, um, bringing it back to kind of current events. Um, we need to talk, talk about climate change and think about the Earth. Um, so realistically, before we are thinking about settling on other planets or other planetary bodies, we need to think about why it is we have to do that and what it is we're doing to Earth. Um, so I think that there's lots of questions that need to be answered um, in regards to Earth and how we look after our Earth, because we don't want to do that to other planets. Um, and then from a science point of view as well, although it would be great in my lifetime to see humans go to Mars, there's so much more science we can do without sending humans there. Um, and the risk of contaminating the surface is quite a lot. Um, somebody once said to me that if we went to the moon right now and we found signs of life, we couldn't say that that was lunar life because us as humans have contaminated the moon so much. Um, and now there's lots of protocols in place to try and stop that happening with exploration of the solar system. Um, but sending humans there is going to be contaminating. Um, and I think there's lots of questions we want answered before we start thinking about doing it. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. Okay. In science and in, the, in, this, in the ocean, uh, there are attempts to, and uh, more than attempts and programs, to, for example, to bring tourists down to the Titanic wreckage and so on. Um, uh, James Cameron has dived to the deepest point, but it, it was just, it, it's just technical. So we are living in a, an epoch where uh, there, some people have enough money to do what they want, and uh, it has nothing to do with science, though. So, no. Even if they have technological achievements, um, I think it's still something different to produce scientific results and data. And I hope in the future to be able to uh, still improve uh, the, the amount of data and the quality of the images and so on, and the, the intelligence we can bring into these, uh, these tools. This is what... Uh, fascinates me. Uh, there are people, uh, I think in Japan or in China, there are at least programs on paper studies uh, to have uh, deep sea manned stations like the space station. Uh, and that makes me scary. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's some, somehow it's looking for an escape or uh, when our earth is not uh, in a suitable <laughs> healthy state anymore so it makes me very uh -huh. scary so I, I prefer sticking with the scientific observation thanks yeah i can definitely relate to both your answers um i was uh, i was a, an astrobiologist for a while and yeah speaking about life on other planets and extremophiles on earth and the limits of life it's always fascinating to see how we humans have a tendency to project ourselves in other places and forget to be our about our home and where we are used to, to live. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. I don't see other uh, questions in the chat. Um, so thank you very much for your time again. Uh, this was a fascinating talk and a fascinating Q&A session. Uh, thank you everyone in the chat for your participation. And uh, on this note, uh, I think it's time to say goodbye.